This episode is brought to you by William, Andrew, Stephen, and Edward, this week's newest patrons. There have been some dramatic and insane changes in the world that have impacted the boat market like nothing we've really ever seen in the past. And we're going to talk about those things today and answer some really huge questions. So stay tuned to the end also for the most controversial part of this, this whole mess. The boats that you can't buy if resale matters at all. So you want to buy a sailboat, but you're worried about a few things. Foremost, the cost of boat seems a little bit high right now, and frankly, it's because it is. But also, what if you don't end up liking the whole boat life sort of thing, and you need to sell it? Will you lose a bunch of money, and will you even be able to sell the thing? And so much has happened in the market since 2020, and it changed not only the price of a good boat, but also the people who were buying them. This week on Everything You Need to Know, is it the right time, right now, to buy a sailboat? COVID drastically changed the world, there's no doubt about that. And what it did to the boat market is very similar what it did to the housing market. All this stay at home business really made us look harder at where we were living and demanding more space, not just for recreation, but also with the huge move to working from home in a lot of industries meant that we needed office space too. Our lifestyles changed and more and more people wanted a little bit bigger homes, but at the same time, the people who had the nice big homes didn't want to sell them in the middle of the chaos of COVID. So the market got very hungry with little in the way of new houses to buy. So prices skyrocketed. The same thing happened with boats. Those of us who had boats during COVID were very, very thankful we did. Isolating with just your household was not that big of a problem because you could go for a sail or take the boat out. Heck, you could go sailing for a month because we were off work for a bit there. And everyone stuck at home could only really wish they had a boat to get them out of the house. And of course, during COVID, production shut down and new boats were harder and harder to buy. So those of us who had boats found that we could get a lot more money for them. We started seeing $10,000 1980s sort of club racers, like say the CNC 30, selling for 30, 40, or even $50,000. It was insane. The bigger boats did the same thing, but in some cases even worse. We saw 40 something foot Benetos go from $100,000 to upwards of 160, and this carried on getting worse for a couple of years, until more recently. Without a doubt, 2021, early 2022 was the worst time to buy a boat. But here we are coming up on the summer of 2023 and things have changed a little bit, but not in all cases. There are a couple of staple boats that I keep an eye on um, to judge the market. So let's check those out. The CNC 30 I mentioned earlier, I watched this boat for a very good reason. It's popular enough that they're always for sale somewhere, and plentiful enough that they seem to be all over North America, and it is, in my opinion, the quintessential 80s club racer. This boat is the yardstick to which all others 80s club racers are measured, and for a very long time in the pre-COVID world, these were $10,000 boats, maybe twelve grand. but here we are post post-COVID and they seem to have bottomed out at about 20 grand. I found them in New York. There's one here in Ontario. Here's one in Nova Scotia and then one in South Carolina. The next boat up that I watch is the one I consider to be for the person that is just graduating from the club racer and wants something a lot more comfortable. The next step up, so to speak. And one of the first boats that you see price-wise with an aft cabin and a sugar scoop the Hunter 380. The 380 is a fantastic coastal or lake sailor with more room than you could have ever imagined if you came from the world of club racers where you're used to sleeping in a V-berth. And this was a $60,000 boat for the longest time. In 2022, we were seeing this boat sell for well over a hundred grand, but here we are now and they seem to be going for about 80. Here's one in Hawaii. Or on the East Coast in Virginia, or out in California, or way up in Rhode Island. 
Now I tell you all this and I watched five or six specific boats over the years to explain where we are right now. We know the market skyrocketed post-COVID and we know it's been slowly coming down over the last year or so. But are we in a good spot to buy now or should you keep waiting? My personal opinion is Yes, you can buy a boat right now and feel financially okay about it. Most of the common boats we see for sale right now might be 10 or so percent above what they were before COVID, but they aren't 30 or 40 percent more anymore. And I think that we've probably hit that floor. I really don't see these boats going back down to what they were for three reasons. The first one is the obvious, inflation. The dollar simply changes over the years. It's normal, we all know this. But more importantly, the world changed in two pretty drastic ways. So many more people now are work from home. Now that if they even had the slightest inkling of living on a boat before, now they actually can because they don't have to report into the office every day. And the last thing, and something that you may not think about that's impacted the boat market, the living on a boat thing changed dramatically with the advent of Starlink. We used to all dream of a life aboard, but we had no idea how would we make enough money along the way to really afford to do it. Starlink really changed the game. I don't think we give it enough credit for what it's done for sailing. We used to have huge threads in the cruisers forum about internet. It was as important as water makers and things like that but we don't have them anymore. Internet aboard has just sort of become a non-issue. It's like when we started seeing solar panels on every cruising boat. It's that important. And now that we don't have to think about how we'll get internet on board anymore, more people are getting on board, literally. The next thing we should talk about is the migratory pattern of sailboats. And you might think I'm crazy because sailboats aren't exactly geese, right? But they sort of are. On the East Coast and the Caribbean anyway, they really are. There are these cruising style of sailboats all over the East Coast and throughout the Caribbean. And when they're going to come up for sale is actually pretty easy to predict. And there's a few huge driving factors with these boats starting up in Annapolis. The Annapolis Sailboat Show is an annual event that takes place in Annapolis, Maryland. And it's one of the largest in-water sailboat shows in the world, featuring hundreds of sailboats from major manufacturers and dealers. The show typically takes place in October, it lasts four days, and it attracts tens of thousands of people from all over the world. In addition to showcasing new sailboats, the show also has um, exhibitors selling marine equipment and accessories and services. Um, the sailboat show is known for a really festive atmosphere of sailors, and it's a popular destination for cruisers and boaters and marine enthusi enthusiasts. Attendees can participate in a bunch of activities, including seminars on everything from you know oil changes to anodes and workshops and on-water demonstrations of new equipment. The October sailboat show is to sailors what Comic-Con is to people who like comic books. Anyone who is involved in sailing will be there. And the people who are out on these cruising boats that you're interested in buying tend to flock there to get to the show. The next driving factor in the migration of these boats that I sound crazy for talking about, but I'm right, are the insurance companies. Most insurers will not allow you on a typical boat policy to leave mainland US until the beginning of November. And it's all statistics driven based on hurricane season, which is in the summer in the Caribbean. So you typically do the Annapolis sailboat show in October and make your way down to Florida for November to make the crossing to the Bahamas and get on your Caribbean way. And now I tell you all this to basically tell you when not to buy a boat. All the good boats are usually in the Bahamas by November. Now, of course, you can still find sailboats for sale on the East Coast after everybody's gone to the Bahamas, but it's much better to wait until that huge migration gets back from their trip. And two things drive that migration pattern. First is Georgetown. Anybody who wants to sail to the Bahamas will find themselves in Georgetown at the bottom of the Bahamas, usually in March when all the festivities are. You have some 350 or 400 sailboats all anchored in the same bay, enjoying things like rum tasting on the beach every Thursday, volleyball beach every Friday, beach yoga on Saturday, and so on and so on. Then you have the huge Georgetown regatta in March, and then everybody leaves. The race is on after March, 
against the insurance companies and of course hurricane season. Some people go further south to Grenada, which is largely accepted to be below the hurricane belt by the insurance companies, but most people go back to Florida. If hundreds of cruising sailboats are leaving the southern tip of the Bahamas in March, that means they'll be hitting Florida right about now. April and May, there's a huge influx of proper cruising boats getting back to mainland US, and a lot of them are being put up for sale. And a lot of them already have big anchors and solar panels and water makers, the works. But even if you aren't looking for something that's already outfitted, those boats are flooding the market in a good way, and it drives the market price down every single year when they get back. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make these videos possible. I couldn't do it without you guys. A big shout out to all the existing patrons that have gotten us this far. Um, if you want to help out the channel, uh, please consider becoming a patron. Okay, so on to the most controversial thing I'm going to say here. And if we didn't make people mad last week, this will probably do it. Here we go. 80s boats won't matter in 10 years. Let me explain a little bit here. For my whole sailing life, the market has been absolutely flooded with boats like, like mine. 1980s racer cruisers that could do the Caribbean pretty safely. Boats like my Hughes 35, or a Niagara 35, or the Catalina 36. These things were everywhere. The list of these boats is huge, and there are thousands of them. And you could get one pretty much anywhere for not a whole lot of money. And they are right now still worth pretty good money. 40 grand for a reasonable one. But what will that 40 grand get you in 10 years or in five years? What is that boat going to be worth then? There are a few major, major issues working against these boats right now. And foremost is obviously the age of them. Would you buy a 60-year-old sailboat. Most people wouldn't. How about a 50-year-old sailboat, a 40-year-old sailboat? We might be getting closer, but there's not a big market for them right now. And if you buy one right now and find that after a few years you don't really like it, it's not doing what you needed it to do, you may just end up stuck with it. I've watched personally, with my eyeballs, so many great 80s boats get cut up, and I mean literally with reciprocating saws and thrown into dumpsters and parted out, gone from the face of the earth forever. And most times, the owner is paying out of pocket to get rid of the thing. The next big problem for these boats is that boats changed in the 90s, everything started to get much more space inside and came with typically an aft cabin and maybe a sugar scoop. And while that's completely the norm now, good luck getting a boat without those things, even island packets now have sugar scoops. Can you imagine trying to sell a boat five or ten years from now that doesn't? It would be like trying to sell a car without power steering. People would just look at you weird. Why would anybody give you good money for something like that when they can get the features they want for the same money in something more modern? And lastly, the people buying these boats has changed dramatically. I mean, sure, a full keel ocean going battle axe like the Alberg 37. It's all the rage with the generation of people who fell in love with boats like that. But those people aren't buying boats anymore. They're selling their boats. The people buying boats right now grew up with the 90s boats, like me, and they may still be willing to buy a little bit older club racer, but imagine who's going to be buying these boats in five years. It'll be our kids. Kids who have only seen Benetos and Genoes and Catalinas and Hunters. I hate to say this, but I think we're right on the tail end of the 80s racer cruiser, as amazing as they are, being worth anything at all. And I say that fully knowing I'm diminishing the value of my own boat in the process. For resale, what really matters in a boat right now is a nice picture of the outside showing that it isn't an eyesore and so we can see what rigging it has and everything. A picture of the cockpit where people are going to be basically living when they're under sail. A picture of the saloon and a picture of where they have to sleep. I was going to end this video now, but I think we should address one of the counter arguments right now before I have to do it in the comments later. The argument is these newer boats aren't as good as the old battle axes. And yes, that's an absolutely valid argument. And I agree with you. 
if I got caught offshore in a gale, which I have, um, I'll take that Alberg 37 every day. Boats like that were simply made to do that stuff back then. They had to be made to do that stuff. And I made this point in a previous episode, but I think it bears repeating. The world in which these absolute monster full keel boats were made is a world that doesn't really exist anymore. In the 60s, taking off on a sailboat to sail the world was actually pretty common, maybe more so than it is today. But when you went, you were truly alone. You would be at sea with no help. You would have no source of weather, no global communication, no way to call for help if you if you needed it, often for weeks on end. The boat truly needed to be standalone, so tough that it couldn't fail because if it did, everybody aboard would be lost at sea. Now, we have all those things now, and we have extremely well-documented and safest sort of beaten path ways to travel throughout the world on a sailboat, and when to do it statistically the most safely. And we know the weather way out in advance, and there are very few places in the world now without instant communication. Starlink is a great example again. We have AIS, and we have radar on every boat now. We have significantly better charts. We have... People have sonar on their boats now and excellent depth sounders. The world of sailing around got a whole lot safer and a whole lot smaller and a whole lot easier. And it made the boats, kind of sadly, a whole lot tough. That said, if you still want a complete battle axe of a boat like we made them in the 60s, that also gives you the huge level of comfort that you get right now. You can still get it. Manufacturers realize there is still a market for this stuff. And they still make it, but for a fairly hefty price. I'm looking at Amel, Halberg Razzi, and of course the Big Island Packets. That's it for this week, guys. Until next week, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. <laughs>